Hi everybody, Alex Garris from Skeptico. I wanted to do a quick introduction to an interview I did a little while back with uh, two really interesting guys. One is Dr. Alexander Wendt from Ohio State University, the Ohio State University as those folks like to say it, a heavy hitter, serious academic in the area of international relations. And But what really makes him interesting in regard to a Skeptico interview is that he's kind of stepped out there with some really interesting ideas about a one world state. So I wanted to look at him and his ideas vis-a-vis -vis my old buddy James Corbett from the Corbett Report, who has really become quite a leader in the alternative media area. So again, what the topic was is this idea, this very scary idea of a one world state and whether or not that is as Dr. Alexander Wendt suggests, inevitable, and he's not really, don't get me wrong, he's not taking a kind of a new world order uh, kind of position at all. He, he, he's kind of saying the opposite of that. He's saying, hey, there's maybe a lot of dark things that are going to come with a one world state, but if we step back and really look at what's going on, it is inevitable, and shouldn't we maybe plan for how we can make the best of what is probably coming ahead. And I want to contrast that with James, who really thinks it's a catastrophe. Not that the two are not mutually exclusive. I mean, it could be inevitable and be a catastrophe, but James has a very hard time hearing how anyone could even contemplate what the next step might be in this new world state game. So I understand where he's coming from too. You know, it's, it's, some bad stuff, you know, so, but a very interesting interview with some really, really smart people that take an intellectual approach to uh, kind of an alternative media topic that I think sometimes just gets played to silliness. So I thought it came out really well. I hope you enjoy it. Here it goes. On this episode of Skeptico, there is the you know the deep state idea that behind all this there would be some more almost criminal element that would be you know dealing with dissenters and that kind of thing and um, and I guess that is a worry um, but it seems to me there's much and what you were just saying is exactly how I would put it actually which is that there's a much better chance of dealing with that element that problem in a single global structure where you have sort of a global democracy than there is in a world of 190 separate sovereignties where nobody's in charge. There is no pretense of democracy. There's no pretense of global law um, and where the strong can basically do whatever they want. 500,000 Iraqi children had died as a result of the sanctions on Iraq. When asked, is it worth it? Is it worth it? And Madeleine Albright said, well, yes, I think it is worth it to kill 500,000 Iraqi children. I think that's the mentality of these people, that human life really does not mean anything to them. And to hand them the power and control over the entirety of the globe is something that is, should strike fear into the hearts of anyone who understands what is really at stake here, especially given the uh, technocratic control grid that we're moving into. Stay with us. For Skeptico. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sakaris, and today a show not about consciousness, not about spirituality, not about any of the topics we normally cover. Well, of course, it's somewhat about some of the topics we normally cover, but today we have a very interesting threaded debate, if you will, and I've always wanted to do more of these, and I've never been able to put a lot of them together, but I did today. The, the topic is a one-world state and new world order, if you will. And the two participants are, one, Dr. Alexander Wendt from The Ohio State University, who joined me a few episodes ago to talk about his new book on quantum consciousness and the social sciences. Dr. Wendt is a worldwide recognized expert on international relations and political science. So after that last episode we did, I asked him to stick around and talk about this very influential paper he's done on one world state. Now, what I really thought was interesting about that paper is there's kind of two ways to take it. 
for the crowd that still believes the official narrative, still believes the Republican Party and the Democratic Party are the only influences in the political system, and there's no such thing as a deep state, there's no such thing as a military-industrial surveillance complex, intelligence complex. For those folks, this article by Went is extremely controversial because, hey, America first, man. I mean, why would we ever give up our perch on the top of the heap? But to another group myself included, who believe that deep state politics are really what it's all about and are really what's driving a lot of the not only political decisions that are being made, but world events in general, including the phony war on terror and phony war on science, phony war on drugs, you name it. So for those folks, the paper has significance because what Dr. Went has done is kind of jumped around to that other side and said, okay, even if you accept that there are deep state influences, dark influences on our system, we may still inevitably be heading towards a one world state. And let's look at what that is and how we might want that to form. So when talking to Went, I'm thinking, wow, I'd really like to hear what someone who is on the front lines of really digging into some of these deep state geopolitical shenanigans that go on on a daily basis and what they would think about that. And I wanted someone who is really smart and really takes it from an intellectual perspective, not just from a knee jerk shoot from the hip emotional perspective. And for that, there's no one better to turn to than James Corbett, of the Corbett Report, one of the leading figures in the geopolitical alternative media. So here's what we have today. We have an interview of about 25 minutes with Dr. Alexander Went talking about this paper and his one world state idea. And then following that right immediately after, I have an interview with James Corbett about his thoughts on Went's paper and the idea of any kind of one world state in a new world order. So this was a very fun dialogue for me to have. It's a little bit provocative. I was gonna say at times, I think it's provocative throughout, but it's really the kind of dialogue that I think we really need and I certainly don't see enough of. So with that, let's move on to first, Dr. Alexander Went. here goes. So I'm joined again by Dr. Alexander Went. Thank you, Dr. Went, for sticking around. We just had a wonderful chat about your new book, Quantum Mind and Social Science. But I also want to take the opportunity to talk to you about a topic that you are extremely well known for, would go so far as to say world famous, most influential for this one topic on international relations, and that is this paper that you penned oh, more than 10 years ago and turned into a book titled, Why a World State is Inevitable. So while there isn't a direct link, per se, between that topic and the consciousness science material we normally cover on Skeptico, there are some tangential links that I'd love to explore and love to talk about. So I thought I would invite you to stick around, and you've agreed to do it. So thank you so much for doing that. Sure. No, I'd be happy to, to continue that conversation. So let's start with the basic premise, one world state. That term alone just sends chills up and down the spines of a lot of people. <laughs> Tell us your, your, your basic thoughts on this idea of anarchy and equilibrium and, and just kind of the overview picture of what you're trying to grapple with here. Well, in the article, and this article actually is, um, eventually I want this to be the next book, although it's going to take several years to convert it into a book. So this is something I'm still very interested in. Um, in the article, I'm trying to make the case that whether we like it or not, this is going to happen. Um, there's a separate issue, which I've thought about a lot more since the article, about whether this would be a good thing. Um, and that's what sends chills about people's spines is the idea that this would actually could be a very bad thing. And I have an argument about that, which I think about why it would be a good thing, which we can talk about if you want, but that's not in the article itself. The article is really just saying whether or not we would want this to happen. It's going to happen. And in a way, I think the easiest way to kind of um, state the argument is that 
it actually occurred to me literally in the shower one morning when I thought to myself, you know, in a thousand years, it was inconceivable to me that we would still have a world of anarchic states you know, or a world of anarchy with 190 separate sovereign states. It just seemed insane that that was probably the case a thousand years from now, that in a thousand years we would certainly have a world state if we human beings survived. So in that sense, if you give me enough time, it does seem like a world state is inevitable. And so then I wrote the paper trying... Go, go ahead. Back. I'm sorry. Help people understand. There's a, there's a certain trajectory there that I was going to say obvious, but it isn't obvious because I think you did a great job of pointing that out. I mean, so talk about that. I mean... We are 190, and we didn't used to be 190. I mean, well, I think if you think about the trends in the system, um, and actually one of the data—it's not really data; it's more of a spec, somewhat speculation. But um, I, I quote this one uh, author, Robert Carnero, who made an estimate that in like 3000 BC there were something like 600,000 independent political units in the world, most of which are like tribes and. and hardly states at all, but they were separate sovereign entities and a hundred thousand of them. And now we have 190. So if you look at that, if you plot that trajectory on a graph, what you see is a tremendous consolidation of political authority worldwide over the, the ensuing millennia. So you project that a bit further and you end up with one. Um, so it seems to me that there has been an increase in the number of states since World War II with decolonization and the breakup of the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia and so on. But overall, I think the trend historically is toward fewer and fewer and fewer states. And if you add in uh, globalization, the internet, climate change, that war between states is becoming irrational, there are just many, many, many factors that um, make the idea of the separate sovereign states increasingly silly, basically. You know, what's the really point? Quickly, quickly, if you can, go over a couple of those. So globalization means the interdependence and interconnectedness of economies, and that makes it less likely that you go and bomb your partner. And it's obvious to anyone who's a little bit older, like I am, that you say, gee, you know, 20 years ago, you could think about invading China or being at war with China. Now you go, geez, you know, it'd be destructive to our economy and their economy, less likely to happen. Not say it wouldn't happen, but it wouldn't. Or if you look at Canada or Mexico, you go, gosh, we're so interdependent, less likely to happen. Internet, more connected, less likely to happen. Right? So all these things are pointing in the direction you're saying that as you become more connected, you're less likely to go to war with people. Yes, and you could add in uh, the spread of democracy, the so-called democratic peace. You know, the democracies hardly ever go to war with each other. Um, but, you know, the growth of international institutions. Now, all of these things just make war less likely. They don't necessarily mean that states are going to come together and form a global state. But I guess the point is, is that if if war is off the table, and if you know exercising national sovereignty in the world economy to resist this globalization is off the table, then what is the point really at the end of the day of, re of retaining sovereignty? I mean, the way I define sovereignty, and the way I think about it, especially now, is that at the end of the day, sovereignty is the right to kill foreigners with no accountability. It's the right to invade other countries if you think it's in your national security interest uh, with no accountability. And it seems to me that that right um, is increasingly obsolete or pointless in a sense, because who's going to do that anyway? And I would say that right has no moral foundation. And that gets to the more normative argument about is this a good thing? I don't think there's any justification actually for one group of people having the right to invade a foreign country if they decide it's in their national interest and kill foreigners with no accountability. And even um, that might set off you know, wild debates and heated debates. I, I think what's refreshing about what you're doing is you're stepping back and going, okay, we can get into a big fight about uh, a particular, you know, Libya or any, or Syria today or some hot issue today. But if you just step back and say, as Americans, let's say, our values would be at, at their core that we don't do that kind of stuff. So even the folks who are saying that this was an exceptional situation where we had to do it, yada, 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 still they would agree that that is not within our basic moral value system 
to to do those kind of things, right? Is that my capture? Yeah, I think if if you are a liberal in the broad sense of believing in human rights and all that, and if you are committed to democracy in the broad sense that people should have the ability to hold power over them accountable, then um, it's very hard, it seems to me, to justify separate groups retaining the right to kill foreigners, violating their human rights with no accountability, violating democracy, their democracy, with no accountability. It's just very hard from a Western, but it's not just the Western, it's an increasingly global um, set of moral values um, to justify that kind of sovereignty. And the, the article that I'd like to write that follows up on this World State paper I want to call anarchy as despotism. You know, everyone says that a world state would be despotic and a totalitarian state. Actually, the current system of anarchy, in my view, is a despotism because states can do whatever they want to to each other with no, no accountability. Um, so I would like to turn the argument around, in effect, and put the onus on the defenders of the sovereign state to, to defend the right to kill foreigners unilaterally. I don't see how you can do that. Let's talk about that because it's 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 interesting and there's two angles I'd like to address. Is one is the folks who are upfront about that argument and are arguing against you, but the other that that you addressed, I thought, which is really refreshing, is the kind of covert uh, opposition to that. So if we accept the idea that uh, governments act in secret at times, and we have plenty of evidence for that, and mm -hmm. we have black operations, and we now know that people were, whether they are today or not, were abducted and taken and tortured and other things happened that don't exactly fit with our values. And then if you take that by extension, like a lot of people do and are serious about looking at and saying, you know, there is this shadow government that's in play, and that then becomes you know, just a huge fear factor in terms of what you're proposing, a one world state, and you're just like, geez, that's exactly what those guys want, that we're playing into their hands kind of thing. And I don't need you to go down that whole path, but I think, and even if you go down that path a little bit, you present some rather compelling arguments why, even if we do, even if we accept the darkest scenario there, we still may be better off with the one world state. So do you want to touch on that? Yeah, I think that's right. I think that, um, well, first, I think that we would only get to a world state voluntarily. Um, if you think about America, you know, 10 years ago was at the height of its power and no state in world history has ever had such a preponderance of power as the United States did 10 years ago. And there's no way that 10 years ago the U.S. could have conquered the world and subjected it to a world state under American control. So if it didn't or couldn't have happened 10 years ago, it's never going to happen violently, it seems to me. Um, so if there's going to be a world state, it's only going to happen through a democratic, very incremental process where everybody's rights get written into the global constitution. At least, at least on the at least on the surface, or at least quasi democratic. I mean, right. a lot of people would argue that, but I mean, if you look at the the EU, for example, there's a lot of shenanigans and a lot of back channel deals and all that, but it basically kind of works, right? Yeah, no, that's that's a good point. That this would be on the surface, it would be democratic and liberal, probably. So there is the you know the deep state idea that behind all this there would be some more almost criminal element that would be, you know, dealing with dissenters and that kind of thing. And, um, and I guess that is a worry. Um, but it seems to me there's much in what you were just saying is exactly how I would put it actually, which is that there's a much better chance of dealing with that element, that problem in a single global structure where you have sort of a global democracy than there is in a world of 190 separate sovereignties where nobody's in charge. There is no pretense of democracy. There's no pretense of global law um, and where the strong can basically do whatever they want um, and the weak will suffer what they must, you know, to quote Thucydides, I think, or paraphrase Thucydides. Okay, so one is that there's a forced dem democracy to the one world state, at least on the surface level and in a lot of ways, as we see in our current government, 
the surface level counts, you know. I mean, you, there's still some accountability, no matter how bleak of a view you have of the situation, there is still some accountability to common values and principles that we all share, and you're saying that point one would be there would be that same accountability to this com common liberal democratic ideal set that we all hold. What are the other reasons why you think this the one world state might be better despite all the possible problems with it? Well, just taking a, before I answer that, I may just go back to your point a second ago. I think that part of the motivation here on the normative side, on the moral side, is to hold the power of very powerful states accountable. So especially the power of the U.S. Um, you know, if I was an Iraqi citizen in 2003, I would be really angry at what happened about the U.S. coming in. I mean, Saddam Hussein was obviously a very bad guy, but many, many Iraqis suffered horribly as a result of that invasion, which I think everybody agrees was a catastrophic mistake um, in almost every sense. Um, and there's no accountability of that. And it's not just America, it's China, it's Russia. All these powerful states can basically do whatever they want um, to smaller countries if those powerful states judge it to be in their national interest. So the idea here is to hold the powerful states accountable to the weaker ones um, who otherwise have no recourse. Um, now, to go back to your question about, I'm sorry, I lost the, the last part of it, which was... That was excellent, um, and I'm glad you added that in, and, and anyone can just look at the world stage that we have. And right now, if you want to do something bad, you just run off in <laughs> some little country in Eastern Europe and you just throw some money around and land the black helicopters and go do whatever you want. And we have documented proof of that where you can set up your little interrogation cell or you can go yeah. get a group of bandits together and go. So you're right. It's hard to imagine how there could be any less accountability than there is now. So let me lead you into this other point that I took out of your talk and that really struck me is you, you talked about just scale and how, uh, you know, that even the, the, the scaling of things up to this one world state would have some advantages for individuality and individual freedoms and rights and that do you want to talk to that am i getting that right do you know what i'm talking about um well i would have uh advantages in the sense that certain kinds of, it would be much harder to violate the rights of some people namely foreigners because there wouldn't be any more foreigners right everybody would be domestic um on the other hand i, I do agree with critics of the world state idea that, you know, in a world of 10 billion people, you know, a democratic election, you know, one vote doesn't count for a lot. Um, and so there is a scale problem in that sense. And, you know, my personal view is that if there is going to be a world state, it should be as decentralized as absolutely possible so that individual votes um, and democracy matter. Um, but I guess that's what I heard. That's what I heard in, in your one talk that struck me is that you were, I think, saying that there's an inevitability to that multiculturalism remaining intact because that's a basic need that people have and that both in order to govern you would have that and in the same way we have 50 states and my wife is from Alabama and you go to Alabama and they've retained some cultural values and, and beliefs that pacify them to the extent that they say okay you know we can kind of live in this thing you also pointed out India, where there's a hundred different languages in a country, and yet, you know, we can still have a democracy that works, and we can recognize that we can't impose this kind of universal uh, cultural overlay on it, so that it, it really can work in both ways. Yeah, actually, the India example, I'm glad you mentioned that, because, you know, there's over a billion people in India, and this is a relatively, I mean, it's not a perfect democracy, but it is a democracy and it's been one for 60 some years. And, um, and if a billion people can be a democracy, then 10 billion, it seems to me, can be a democracy. Um, and India preserves a tremendous amount of cultural diversity, linguistic diversity and cultural diversity, ethnic diversity and so on. So in a way, it's a microcosm of what a world would be. 
Um, and again, if you're already at that scale in India, going to the global level isn't, it seems to me, a huge extrapolation, um, especially because in the 18th century, you had philosophers saying that democracy was only going to work in very, very small communities, literally a few hundred thousand people. And, you know, and India is a billion already, and we have a dem- functioning democracy. So um, I don't see a scale problem except that it waters down individual votes. Um, right, right, right. You mentioned where you might be going with this line of thought, and it might spawn another book. Can you tell folks where you are in that process? Well, it's just at the beginning stages. I'd like to write, uh, I'm basically going to spend the next year dealing with fallout from the quantum book and writing whatever you know, defenses and replies to the critics that I need to. Um, but I have this one paper I want to write about of anarchy being a despotism to kind of counter the world state being a despotism kind of argument. But I'm sort of trying to conceptualize this world state book as volume two of the quantum story. So I'd like to somehow connect it to the quantum argument in the, in the book I just published. I'm not sure how to do that yet. Um, but I do, I do see um, social collectivities as a kind of organism, um, which is in the quantum book already. Um, and I think I see the world system, the international system, as an organism. And I think that I'd like to sort of, you know, and, and organisms develop in a certain direction over time um, as they mature. And so I'd like to make some kind of a teleological argument about organismic development that has some kind of quantum basis to it. But that's pretty speculative at this point, and I'm not sure how to make that argument work. But I do see the two books together, in a sense, as volume one and volume two. Um, It's just going to take several years, probably, to work this out. Okay, before I totally let go of this interview with Dr. Alexander Went one more little tidbit that that he added after I thought we're all done, that I thought was interesting. But, you know, my general feeling is, and I should have said this on the show, is that human beings know a lot less than we think we do. You know, we're just at the beginning of figuring out the nature of the universe, it seems to me. And I think a lot of scientists and my colleagues think, actually, we're really smart and we've already got most of it figured out. And I just think that's completely wrong. Um, and so who knows what 100 years, even 100 years from now, people will, real, will take as common sense that today we can't even imagine. Um, so... Thanks again to Dr. Alexander Went for joining me today and talking about this. Now, before we move on to James Corbett, let me throw in a couple ideas here. One is that what I really appreciate about what Went's saying is that here's someone who is from the inside of the system, if you will, who's really taking an honest look at the deep systemic problems in the system. And let's face it, you just don't hear that much. You don't hear people inside academia exploring the the possibility that there is a very real, deep, fundamental problem with the way our political system is operating. So one of the real appeals, I think, of Wentz Peace is to say, well, let's turn the whole thing around. If there is this deep, unstated agenda to drive us towards a one-world government, which a lot of people make a good case for, then let's explore that. Let's bring it out in the open and kick around what that might mean. But, of course, I wanted to get another perspective on that, and I certainly did with our next guest, James Corbett from The Corbett Report. Let's move on to that interview. Today we welcome James Corbett to Skeptico. James is a leading member of the alternative media who, through his various podcasts, YouTube channel, blog posts, and short and long-form documentaries, which are really sensational, folks. You have to check those out. He is producing just an insane amount of high-quality geopolitical news that's just vital stuff for today's time. So much so that I honestly, as I was just joking with him earlier, don't know how he does it. But he does, and you can find it all at the Corbett Report, which we'll, of course, have linked up in this show. James, welcome back to Skeptico. Thanks so much for joining me. Well, thank you for having me back on. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. 
Well, it was kind of an interesting turn of events that led me to you. Your work is on my mind because I do check out your website whenever there's a news event, like the latest horrible tragedy in Paris. You know, people, even in my family and friends, ask me what's going on. And until I check out your website, along with a few other websites, I don't even want to venture even an opinion on that because I think for a growing number of people, including myself, the alternative media is the go-to first source to sort through the other information that we get. And I'm sure you hear that from a lot of folks. Uh, well, I do. And that's obviously a huge responsibility and one that I don't take lightly. So I do try to uh, put in as much effort as I can to try to sort out things uh, that I'm going to talk about before I talk about them. But as I think you know, it's, it is a huge responsibility to have an audience that relies on you for information on any subject. So I, uh, I definitely try to live up to that. Well, and you do a wonderful job of it. And today, of course, we're not going to be talking so much about current events directly, but I thought when I interviewed Professor Alexander Went from Ohio State University about his recent book on really consciousness science and the social sciences, I was just intrigued because I knew this guy had a huge profile in the political science and international relations field. And in particular, he had drawn the attention of the alternative media a few years ago when he wrote a very influential article about one world state, about the inevitability of the one world state. But James, when I was talking to him, what really intrigued me and motivated me to contact you was here's an academic who seems to be taking seriously and thinking deeply about a lot of the issues that you talk about in terms of deep state issues, black helicopter issues, alternative interpretations of the reality that we're fed. So I don't know that even a lot of people in his field have appreciated the extent to which he's really looked at it from that perspective. So on one hand, I found that incredibly refreshing, but I also found his conclusions about that challenging in many ways since they do go against, I think, the conventional alternative media perception of the inevitability of a one world state. Now, I know I've shared the interview with you and you've had a chance to give it a listen. Maybe we can start, if you could give people a sense of maybe just the thumbnail sketch of a primer of new world order. I mean, what that even means, how you first came across the term and, and what it means to people now. And that, I know that could take an hour, but it certainly could. In fact, it could take uh, several years as I've been doing at my website. So I would suggest people uh, try to, if they're interested in this, try to take a look at some of the work I've done in the past. But I guess the thumbnail sketch would be to say that although the New World Order sounds like some kind of strange and, and weird conspiracy tale, it's in fact one of the oldest and most basic stories of history. It's the quest for consolidation of total control in the hands of a ruling clique. And uh, that should not come as a surprise to any student of history. That's what so many different uh, uh, emperors and, and other would-be um, uh, hangers-on to power in the past have, have lusted after and tried to consolidate under their control in the past. I don't think that the modern phenomenon is, is fundamentally different other than the fact that it is truly on a global scale at this point. And the idea of a globally consolidated world uh, government of some sort is something that is at least feasible. I don't think it's likely to happen in the near future, but it's, uh, as as uh, Professor Went talked about, and as I, th I, I actually agree, I think that the, uh, the, the logic of the situation leads us in that direction. And I think we've been trending that way for a very long time. And I think people who are opposed to that idea, like myself, uh, do themselves a disservice by believing that the actual opposition to world government is going to come by adhering to nationalism. I think that the, the as I say, the logic of the nation state uh, mentality that we've been fostered in for the last couple of centuries leads us almost inevitably, inexorably towards the, that consolidation of control in a world government. So I think we have to interrogate the actual roots of the philosophy that uh, leads one in the direction of giving up one's own individual sovereignty towards some sort of abstract collective. And I want you to talk about that because I know that's a very important keystone to your personal 
philosophy, uh, I guess, on how to move forward with the situation we're in. But just touch on for a minute, you know, the modern instantiation of the new world order as it's been kind of popularly understood as this alternative, you know, scary out there conspiracy thing really started, I think, with George Bush Sr., who fuel few people even remember anymore, but he was the one who was really kind of open about using this phrase at the UN and in other places and saying new world order, new world order. And and then it kind of took on a life of its own where people really kind of started calling him. And then these guys just started outing themselves and using it more and more. Clinton jumps in there and says, yeah, I agree with Bush. We need a new world order. And now they're all just kind of out there. What's going on? Why are they so, I guess, up front now about that they're just emboldened by the emboldened by the fact that they think they can pull it off well for for the history of the term new world order i would go back a little bit further to early 20th century when hg wells actually wrote a book called the new world order talking about this and of course wells is known today as some sort of science fiction fantasy kind of author but um was actually a, quite a, an important political figure in his time and in fact wrote the what became the uh, uh the united nations uh, charter of human rights he actually wrote the first draft of that so he was he was actually quite an important political mover and shaker and in his formulation what he was talking about was basically a technocratic control grid, that there was going to be a world government that was going to be presided over by benevolent, wonderful scientists and engineers who would find the best way to basically engineer society. And I think that gets at the heart of what this idea ultimately is. It's uh, a lot of control freaks who believe they're going to socially engineer us all for, for our own best interests. But I think on top of that, there is the, uh, the, the ruling clique that really funds the, those uh, scientists and engineers uh, and their, their research projects along for the purpose of consolidating that control in their own hands, and I think for, for much more sinister purposes. So uh, the, the, this term has a pedigree, and it goes back at least a century um, in terms of that formulation, New World Order. Uh, and it has been propounded by a lot of people in the past. For example, in World War II, uh, Hitler liked to talk about the, the New World Order. And at that time, explicitly, a lot of the anti-Nazi uh, types of cartoons and things uh, even uh, that you got from from uh, Disney and other places like that would, would actually make fun of the New World Order and things like this. It was it was quite au courant at that time. Yes, it does have a Third Reich ring to it. It's, it? it certainly should, I think, because I think that is a good way of understanding the, the kind of quest that uh, the people who are promoting it are on. But it did obviously go out of fashion after um, after that for, for some time. And as you say, was brought back right into the heart of uh, the, the sort of the, the upper political echelons and the, the policy wonks you know, with George Bush's 1990 speech. So uh, from that point on, it has been much more open, but it's still talked about, uh, of course, quite a bit by by the Henry Kissingers and Zbigniew Brzezinski's and other types of academic uh, movers and shakers behind the scenes who have been um, involved in a number of different administrations going back decades now. And uh, I, I think that the reason that it's coming out now is because it really is politically feasible. I mean, the, the reason that uh, George H.W. Bush brought it out in 1990 was because it was the end of the uh, the Cold War era. It was the beginning of a new world order. It was the chance to bring about a new world order. And of course, he framed that in the uh, the idea of a rule of law amongst nations. No longer will we have the rule of the jungle in international politics. Now we have the chance for a new world order in which nations will all cooperate together and will will ha have peace and harmony, which was interesting because he was introducing this at the same time as he was ramping up for the first Gulf War. So the uh, new world order was being introduced as peace even in the midst of war, which I think is uh, probably telling of the philosophy as a whole. And it's been promoted along those lines. Uh, but interestingly, again, it is always in crisis and war and mayhem and chaos that it is used. Uh, directly after 9-11, there was an uh, a influential member of the Council on Foreign Relations, Gary Hart, who came out and said, I think this is the time for uh, George W. Bush to do what his father talked about, and that's create a new world order. And uh, uh, other such phrases like that became quite uh, quite fashionable right after 9-11. And then right after the 2008 economic uh, crisis with the Lehman Brothers collapse, you saw uh, the 
G20 in London that was held in April of 2009. The phrase New World Order, if you even just type that into Google in quotation marks, New World Order G20 uh, 2009, you will get literally hundreds of references from CNN and and uh, other mainstream publications talking about this is the time to create a New World Order. So it's, it's usually phrased in that way, that this is some way to completely reshape the way that we think of international relations in the wake of any crisis. And, okay, and I wanted to put off that line of, of thought that we're going down, but I don't think we can, and we're, we're going to have to put Dr. Went on the back burner for one more second, because we also see the advance of the New World Order agenda in, it, 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 it seems to be steamrolling now. We're rolling it into everything. So climate change, we need a New World Order. GMO, we need a New World Order. Everything that comes along is being tied to that. And climate change is one of the most dramatic ones. Now they're saying, oh my gosh, this this carbon tax we're going to need, and we're going to need to implement this on a worldwide basis. Aha, here, here's a great place where we need the New World Order. So this fear that many have had about the coming pressure towards new world order is fulfilling itself at every turn, it seems, more and more with every new major news event that comes about. Wouldn't you agree? Unfortunately, I have to agree because, again, I think given the logic of the situation, every crisis is a a potential opportunity for those who are seeking to consolidate more power in their own hands. This is not a new political phenomenon. It has been noted for a very long time. And just one example of that, H.L. Mencken uh, back in 1918 wrote, the whole aim of practical politics is to keep the populace alarmed and hence clamorous to be led to safety by menacing it with an endless series of hobgoblins, most of them imaginary. And uh, that sentiment has been repeated uh, a number of times over the years. Uh, Winston Churchill is supposed to have said, never let a good crisis go to waste. Um, whether or not he actually did say that, Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel, former uh, chief of staff of Obama, really did say that on camera a few years ago. So people can look that up on YouTube. The, the idea here is that any any crisis, any problem is an opportunity for those who want to do something that otherwise would be politically unpopular to implement that agenda. And let's just take the most recent events as an example. In the wake of the uh, the Paris attacks, uh, suddenly there's all sorts of things that would have been politically, economically unfeasible suddenly right. become almost uh, almost necessary or quote-unquote necessary. So, for example, the uh, French government was recently chided by the EU for breaking its uh, its budget deficit goals that uh, the EU is attempting to set for its member nations. Uh, but now that this has happened, France is swatting that aside, invoking uh, 42.7 of the EU charter to say, well, we, we are, we're under attack, so we, we don't have to listen to your budget goals. We're going to you know, spend all this money on uh, ramping up security. Or, for example, before the uh, Paris attacks, the EU parliament, one of the largest groups in the EU, EU parliament, proposed the creation of a standing EU army which was not taken very seriously by anyone at the time. After the attacks, the president of the European Commission himself is coming out calling for an, uh, the creation of a standing EU army, and people are starting to listen. So again, every time there is a crisis, no matter really where that crisis is coming from, uh, that is used as a chance for people in positions of power to further consolidate their power. And that's why it's, unfortunately, it's extremely easy to move in that direction. All that has to be done is to convince the public that there is a threat serious enough and uh, and that the only solution, of course, is to give these these uh, people in positions of power more power to do what they apparently weren't doing before the crisis happened. And what they apparently have had on their agenda for a long time, and they seem to be very patient. If we really read it with any kind of lens towards history, we can see that they're they're very deliberate and very patient towards moving towards their goal. So if we accept for a minute that this one world government is part of the agenda of, I hate to say the ruling elite because that sounds so conspiratorial, but let's just leave it there. I think that's a, for a perfect place to bring back Alexander Wentz article on the inevitability of the one world, the, the new world order as, it, or as he calls it, the world state, one world state. Because I think he has in that given us some reasons why we may want to reconsider it despite 
all the horrible abuses that have gone on in order to kind of advance that agenda. And that, of course, is my read of what's going on. It happens to be your read, too. And I challenge anyone who's really looked into the evidence to, to see it much differently. But that's what I thought was intriguing about Went. So he's saying first... Let's go through the points and and hear your response. First, he's saying, guys, this is inevitable. Just if we look at a long enough time frame, of course we're going to get to one state. It doesn't make sense to have all these, this chaos, basically, with all these states running around with their own agenda and now in the nuclear age when people can destroy each other. It's just not where we want to be. Add to that, of course, globalization and the fact that our economies are intertwined and it looks more and more inevitable. Maybe not in five years, 10 years, 50 years, but if you put a a long enough time frame on it, isn't a one world state inevitable? Well, as I say, I do uh, agree with the, the, uh, the, the, the fundamental point being made here. And this goes, this goes back to really what has been a two-century-long process of brainwashing that's been remarkably effective. Uh, the idea of the nation-state of nationalism uh, is not inherent to our nature as human beings. Uh, it didn't really exist very, very much in the way that we think of it today before the 19th century. And that was when uh, there was a battle at Jena in then Prussia, modern-day Germany, where Napoleon swiftly, crushingly defeated the the Prussian army and brought them under uh, subjection to the the French Empire. And it was such a humiliating defeat that uh, through a series of events, the German philosopher Johann Gottlieb Fichte was, uh, was compelled to deliver an address to the German nation where he talked about um, <clears throat> the aim of the state is positive law, internal peace, and a condition of affairs in which everyone may by diligence earn his daily bread and satisfy the needs of his material existence. Uh, that is why this love of fatherland must itself govern the state and be the supreme, final, and absolute authority. Its first exercise of this authority will be to limit the state's choice of means to secure its immediate object, internal peace. To attain this object, the natural freedom of the individual must of course, be limited in many ways. And he went on to talk about how this love of fatherland that was so absolutely primal to this was going to have to be instituted by the establishment of a means of education uh, that would indoctrinate the children into this. And uh, this is all talked about quite openly and, and was taken fully on board in Prussia at the time. And the Prussian education system that developed as a result of this is the model for the system that we have uh, in most of the world today, including where I am here in Japan and where you are in the United States. That is the model that most of the world relies on today, including, of course, kindergarten, um, literally a German word for child garden. Uh, it, so much of it has been completely adopted. And what that has done it has convinced people Uh, into this idea, this love of fatherland um, that, as I say, was not some sort of inherent natural state of nature. And once you get uh, enough of the population believing that that is, uh, their identity is somehow completely tied into some sort of abstract collective like that, it's just a question of swapping out one abstract collective for another. So instead of rallying around the flag of the United States, well, why not rally around the flag of the North American Union or the United Nations or whatever whatever else you want to swap it out? I mean, obviously, that will require more brainwashing and indoctrinating, indoctrination to get people to switch over, but it's certainly, there's no, there's no fundamental reason that can't be attained. So I think, again, within that, that system where we do have to subor- uh, subordinate ourselves and our, our individual freedom to this collective so that we, the state can have supreme, final, and absolute authority, once you buy into that system, Yes, ultimately, eventually, it is going to consolidate into a single system of control. Yeah, but see, that's what I think is refreshing about Went. I mean, he's taking the argument of individualism versus collectivism and saying, hey, guys, that isn't necessarily bound up with one world state. And as a matter of fact, he gives some good reasons why it may be better in terms of us maintaining our individualism, maintaining our our inherent rights, if you will, under a one world state than through the anarchy that's created in the situation that we have now. If you remember in the interview, I think that's one of his points. And I think it's a good one. You know, in the current situation where you can just 
get together your secret spy, seal, whatever you want to call them, group, and go abduct people and take them to some foreign country where you can just throw money around. I mean, how could it be a worse situation than that? There is zero accountability. So we can go in and we can kill hundreds of thousands of women and children in Iraq, and there's no accountability. I mean, how can it really be worse? Well, it, it certainly could be worse by handing the people who are behind the system as it exists today even more power and less accountability because ultimately the, the point, I think, is that once you have a world system of governance, then if – by some happenstance, wouldn't you know it, that system of governments uh, gets taken over or hijacked or is put into place, as I would put it, by the same types of uh, psychopathic ruling clique that uh, that are currently in charge of, well, much of the world today and, of course, uh, some of the out-of-control uh, powers in, in the world, uh, then what what would be the recourse to that, especially in a world government that's presided over by the types of technological uh, control grid technologies that are coming into place with uh, tracking and surveillance and uh, basically the ability of the state to know what you're doing at all times and to restrict your, your movements and things of that nature. Uh, we're, we're looking at something that's not only... Um, not not only sort of the ultimate nightmare of people fighting fighting the Nazis back in World War II or what have you who thought you know well what if what if uh, Hitler takes over the world I mean at this point uh, it's not just that it's that there's actually a technological grid behind this that would allow uh, the types of control over society that no previous dictator in history could have even dreamed of. And I, I think it's important to understand, I mean, there's a, a couple of ways of answering that objection. And one of them, I think, would be immediately understandable to yourself and I imagine your whole audience, which is to say it's a matter of principle, really, more so than it is about the utilitarian consequentialist argument. Wouldn't it be better if we all lived in that society? Uh, and the, the, the question of principle is one, as I say, I think should appeal to yourself and your audience, because it's the exact same objection that people might raise with you, saying, Alex, Alex, why do you, why do you keep fighting so hard against this materialist philosophy? Who cares if it's right or wrong? It builds us a better toaster, and ultimately, doesn't that, isn't that better? I mean, it makes your life a bit better. Um, and of course, that that isn't the point. Uh, the point, I assume, of what you're doing is to try to get at truth and to actually, uh, uh, you know, expose that to, to more people and uh, get people to think about that. So uh, I would say, again, it's, it's more a question of principle. And, and the principle of it is that there is, uh, there is a certain fundamental moral principles that cannot be uh, breached by any people wearing any hats, proclaiming whatever kind of authority, any funny badges they might have that they, they think gives them special rights to do things that you and I can't do, like use force, fraud, and coercion against others to do things, against peaceful people to do things against their will. I think no one has the right to do that. But beyond the matter of principle, which is ultimately what I would argue on, I think it, there's also a consequentialist argument to be made here, that this would in fact be absolutely, uh, in an absolute sense, it would be uh, nightmarish to to give this type of power and control to a bloodthirsty psychopathic elite who really do uh, lust after the large scale reduction of the human population so that they uh, will ultimately use technology to rule over a very small clique of uh, humans that are allowed to to basically live on this planet. It might sound far-fetched, but let's put that in some historical perspective of the type of psychopaths who have risen But, but hold power. on, before, before you do that... No, I'm... I will I will continue with this. So let's look at some of the examples of, of people like this. And let's look at a very interesting family that goes back to the mid-19th century. There's someone named Dr. Bill Livingston who passed himself off as a celebrated cancer specialist. And he roamed around the New York State state countryside, selling, literally selling snake oil to the trusting population of New York State. And uh, he was a lovable rogue. Uh, he was a, a dashing man who used his good, char looks and good looks and charm to basically swindle people out of money time and time again, um, pretending to be deaf and dumb and using a slate to, to converse with people, begging for money, that type of thing. Just ridiculous types of little schemes like that. And uh, he had a family which he then destroyed by uh, uh, raping one of the maids of uh, the family and uh, fathering children with her, running away when they tried to uh, ar arrest him for it, uh, f engaging in bigamy in, in Canada. Uh, he had a very strange life and uh, was constantly on the run from the law. But one thing that he did teach his children before he ultimately abandoned them was uh, that basically how to sweet, uh, 
cheat and swindle other people. In fact, he said, I always cheat my children every chance I get. I want to make them sharp. And this is interesting, not because this is Dr. Bill Livingston. That was just a name that he made up to avoid the law. It's because his actual name was William Livingston Rockefeller. And he was the father of John D. Rockefeller, who, of course, went on to found Standard Oil, which, through the most unscrupulous practices, managed to rise to the position of oil monopoly in the late 19th century and found the Rockefeller family fortune. And uh, by the late 19th, early 20th century, the Rockefeller family was, well, John D. Rockefeller specifically, was reviled by the American public. They absolutely detested the man because he was the symbol of everything that was that was wrong about this lust for money and power. And he was popularly charactered as this colossus basically holding the U.S. government in his hand. And, uh, and uh, Standard Oil was an octopus taking over the, the planet. Uh, at that time, uh, Rockefeller decided to turn his money, his fortune, into political power by becoming the most wonderful philanthropist on the planet and founding the Rockefeller Foundation in 1913, which then started funding a whole series of things, one of which was the American eugenics movement, which, uh, for people who don't know, of course, eugenics was the rock star super science of the early 19th century in the way that climate change is the rock star super science of today. And it was, it's now the outdated pseudoscience that said that by measuring people's, the width of people's eyeballs and, and you know, the, the length of their nose and things like this, we can determine that certain types of people are just fundamentally criminal people and uh, they're lower intelligence and they're likely to, uh, to lead to lives of crime and poverty and, and horrible things. Of course, this was fundamentally racial characteristics and thus certain races just were disfavored and should be uh, bred out of the gene pool you know, one way or another. So they started, of course, the forced uh, sterilization laws uh, that were very popular in the United States in the 1920s and 30s, funded by research that was done at the Cold Springs Harbor Laboratory, the American e Eugenics uh, Records Office, funded by the Rockefellers, who, of course, also funded the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Nazi Germany that became the basis for Nazi uh, eugenic pseudoscience. That was then, of course demonized after the war because of what uh, Hitler did. So they decided to create something called crypto eugenics, which was to take this same idea that basically there is a certain ruling class of people who by their very genetic makeup are suited to be our natural rulers. This is literally what eugenics preaches. They decided to take that philosophy and roll it into uh, other fields. Just don't call it eugenics anymore because no one likes that word. So uh, John D. Rockefeller III, who was heavily involved in the American Eugenics Society, took the head of the American Eugenics Society and plopped him into a position at the newly created Population Council, which was funded through the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Okay, but and, James, James. And I'm going to continue <laughs> until I am finished with this point. And we roll out from there with the, uh, the Rockefeller family continuing to, uh, to fund things along that line. And uh, again, I understand there's so many facts and names and dates and figures here. No, oh, it's, it's history. That. I it's don't want to hear about this. No, but no, this is at no, least I've an, no, no, I'm going to continue with this point. This is at least a window into the psychology and the motivations behind the creation of world government. It is not something where it is going to be, if we just give them this power, then they'll be happy with the power. It's what they are using the power for. And I think perhaps the more succinct version of this story, which I will now deliver, is that uh, <laughs> you can also see this mentality in, for example, someone like Madeleine Albright, who back in the 1990s, when asked about the, the sanctions on Iraq at that time, and the, the, uh, the, the fact that they had killed 500,000 Iraqi children, 500,000 Iraqi children had died as a result of the sanctions on Iraq, when asked, is it worth it? Is it worth it? And Madeleine Albright said, well, yes, I think it is worth it to kill 500,000 Iraqi children. I think that's the mentality of these people, that human life really does not mean anything to them. And to hand them the power and control over the entirety of the globe is something that is, should strike fear into the hearts of anyone who understands what is really at stake here, especially given the uh, technocratic control grid that we're moving into. You know, I used to watch those, oh, those commercials for the Navy. And it used to just link my blood boil. I wouldn't want to grab the remote and throw it at the TV. You know, all the nice music in the beautiful ocean, say, a force for peace, you know. And, you know so mad. and then at some point, it turned for me. And I said, you know what? That's the best freaking chance we have. 
is that the American people still hold to the idea that there are certain values that we stand for. There are certain moral principles that are at our core. That's what I think Went is talking about. That's what I think turns the table. We're fighting a fight against the people that you're talking about. Let's acknowledge that. Where do we want to battle it? Do we want to battle it with the idea that pushing against their inevitable agenda? Or do we want to jump out in front of it and say, I think Went is right? Any one world state would only come about if it, at least on the surface, reflected our liberal democratic values of justice, of freedom, of equality for all people in the world. Why don't we get in front of the game and say, one world state? Of course, placate me is the term that I say, you know, I can be placated just like I think you can be, James, and I've heard you say it, you know, if you're left to your individual rights, if those rights are protected, if you're given certain um, freedoms, then y you have a lot less interest in what the scoundrels who are always going to be scoundrels are doing. So isn't this an opportunity to change the battlefield by switching sides, if you will? Well, if you could provide me of that quotation saying that I would be happy with just some of my individual rights and let the scoundrels be scoundrels, I'd be interested to hear that quotation. Hold it. I didn't mean to, to misrepresent what you're saying, but I just heard that in, a, in one of your recent podcasts. I mean, I, the, the spirit of it was that, you know, you don't, you're not interested in playing police on everything that everyone does. You're your key points for you are your individual rights and freedoms. And to the extent that those are given to you, you can't have a, a say in, in. No, well, okay. Okay. I see, I see what you're saying, but that is a fundamental misunderstanding of, of my position because rights are not given by anyone. They, they're not something that is uh, protected. Uh, well, in, let's enshrined. put it this way. The only rights that exist are negative rights. I, you cannot do that thing to another person rather than rights that somehow you are entitled to something simply because you exist. So I think that there's a fundamentally different political outlook that arises from the, the latter. But you get former. my point. I certainly do. Um, let's, let's address this uh, through, uh, I think there is a point of accord here. There is a point of agreement in that ultimately I, for example, because I, I am against the nationalist ideology exactly as much as I'm against the globalist ideology, I agree that there is a, it is a global borderless world. That's what it is naturally. There are no lines on a map that has, have any real meaning in reality other than what we make of them. And because of that, we are becoming a globally connected society in terms of our technology, allowing people to communicate and interact freely around the world. And so we are becoming a global society. And it really is a question of whether you want to do that in a way that is free and open or a way that is shut and, and, and uh, malleable to control. And, and I, I, of course, uh, I do advocate for the former rather than the latter through such things as I've talked about on my podcast in the past, like the peer-to-peer -peer economy, I think is a wonderful, amazing, incredible thing that people can interact and transact with anyone anywhere on the globe. And you could do it through a cryptocurrency or whatever so that it's instantaneous. There's no bank institution that comes in between. It truly is a global sort of global society in that sense. That's the model that I think we have to be working towards rather than putting in a government to control the entire globe. I think it's more about human beings interacting as human beings. And this is that dreaded A word. Oh, no. Anarchism. Oh, chaos, violence. Oh, wait, no. Anarchism actually doesn't mean that. Anarchism simply means uh, without rulers. Uh, that. Let's be careful on that point. It doesn't mean without rules. It means without rulers, i.e. without governments uh, trying to prescribe, limit, control, database, track, catalog, and tell people what to do. And so, yes, I do advocate anarchism, specifically a flavor of it called voluntarism, which I'll allow your audience to look up on their own time if they're interested. But, uh, but yes, I think that's really the solution. Rather than trying to create a government that 
unlike every other government that has ever been instituted in the history of the globe, well, this one somehow will be able to con- more or less keep contained. And yeah, it might kill a few million people here, you know, do, poison our water there, do, do some of those things that they want to do. But, uh, you know, it's just the price you have to pay. Uh, I don't believe that. And I don't, I don't imagine most people actually fundamentally do believe that. And I don't think that's what most people are fighting and dying for in many wars. Oh, you know, we'll, we'll have a, a control by, you know, psychopathically. That's only, that's only a little bit bad. It's not, it's not t- terribly bad. I don't think that's ultimately the solution to this. And I don't think that's what you'd get in the end. I mean, as I say, I think with the technocratic control grid, there would be no way to resist it. And there's, uh, in such a system, there's no way you're going to be able to contain the, uh, the psychopaths at the top in any way. So I think that's a pipe dream. But even given that pipe dream, I would prefer to have the, the voluntaristic society rather than a society ruled by anyone. I guess you hit the, the key phrase to me. It's, it's pipe dream. I mean, it's pipe dream that we are going to be able to organically grow an alternative culture that would be attractive to the largest number of people. I mean, that's one thing that does kind of turn me off about the alternative truth movement kind of view is that ultimately at the end of the day, it does come down to some kind of democratic vote, if you will, even if that movement was to gain momentum and and tremendous favor among larger and larger groups of people, it would still ultimately come down to some kind of vote because that is also in keeping with our democratic values. So what uh, what do you keep saying democratic values for? I don't have democratic values, and I think that's the exact point that I'm arguing, that no, there would not be a vote on this, because that's the point. There is no majority that can force or compel a peaceful min- minority to do what they want morally, and that's the fundamental part, point of this, the moral principle. Again, exactly like yourself arguing against the materialists. But hold on, the, the reason I keep bringing up democratic is that that's one of Wendt's points, is that... We, as the United States, you're a, a Canadian who lives in Japan, who speaks primarily to Americans, although you speak to people all over the world. So, I mean, you're the you're a perfect model of the globalization of liberal democracy, right? Because in its broadest sense, your values are everyone has certain inalienable rights. That's kind of liberalism. Uh, democracy, that you have the right to exist and you have the right to property and those kind of things. I mean, this is what Went is talking about in terms of I, I, yeah, liberal no, I, democratic I, I, I just, values. I'm not trying to invent the term. I'm just trying to use it in the way that he used it in the paper and in the way that... Yes, and that's what I'm fundamentally disputing. I think that's the trap. I think that that's where we get into that trap. And that's why the the, the argument against that can't be within that logic. It has to be outside of that. And the democratic part of that is the, is the, uh, the, the poison that they lure people in with, the, the sweet poison that they lure people in with. I, I don't quite understand. I mean, wouldn't it at the end of the day, I mean, we're going to have to decide, l- let's say that the, you know, this was to work out exactly the way that we want it. And we were able to create whatever st- world state and we could have it be what we, we'd still come down to some kind of vote in terms of what should be those values, what should be the laws, what should be the rules. It does come down uh, to no, a vote at the end. No, it does not uh, necessarily and not in the way that you're thinking. But let's, let's put it this way then. So uh, I guess we'll have to get into this because this is the fundamental point, point of what I'm advocating, which is voluntarism, which is the principle that you can do, you can create whatever kind of community you want under whatever kind of rules you want including a democracy, whatever you want, just so long as it is completely voluntary, i.e. there is no one who is compelled by living in a certain area or whatever to be a part of that community. Um, So ultimately, yes, you can create a structure if you want to, but I could just as easily opt to not be a part of that structure. Thank you very much. And, uh, And no one could compel me by, you know, using a gun or what have you to to uh, make me do anything against my will. So in that case, then yes, then we can. How, how would they not? How, how would you keep people from compelling you? to? Well, do ultimately, I think the question of self-defense is one that it comes down to natural law, i.e. you have the right to defend yourself from being killed by someone. So if there are enough people who are concerned about, for example, well, there's a group over there that's going to try to make me live under such and such a system, then you will d- form an association to defend yourself against it. And that association 
and you're and right back where we are now. I mean, this is <laughs> is by its very nature voluntaristic. You decide to be a part of that association because it serves your interests. Now, contrast that to the system where we're in, where because you live within a certain domain that certain people claim to have the right to rule over, you are compelled to give your support to that governing authority uh, in the terms of taxation, which are extracted uh, from you at the threat of violence. If you don't compel, if you don't obey, they will throw you in a cage. And if you resist being thrown in a cage, you will be killed. So there is the uh, the, the c- compulsion to participate in that type of association. And uh, they get to decide, well, you know what? The United States is under mortal threat from Iraq. So we better go halfway around the world and use your resources that you're giving to us to drop uh, bombs on brown people. I think that's fundamentally an insane way of uh, organizing society. It would make a lot more sense to me if I get to decide, you know what, I think this is a worthy cause. I think we should defend ourselves from these people because they're threatening us. Let's get together and do that. And an association formed on that basis on voluntaristic principles is perfectly fine. The idea that you can compel me to participate in that association is fundamentally immoral. And I realize there is a vast gulf between here and there, i.e. trying to get to that. Can't get but there from that here. is ultimately yeah. what I'm advocating for. And I think, pipe dream or not, that is the principle which I'm, uh, which I'm advocating for. And I, I can't compromise on that principle. There's no moral way for me to say, ah, you know what? Screw you. I don't care what you think. You're going to participate with us. And if you don't, you know, we're going to throw you in a cage. And if you resist that, I'm going to kill you. Uh, I think that's that's not the best way that we can organize society. And I think there, that we have to fundamentally reject that logic in order to get anywhere other than where Went and others are proposing we're going to get. Well, why, why throw Went in there? I and mean, that's certainly <laughs> that's certainly not his position. He's saying agreeing with you wholeheartedly right that's his point is that there should be accountability people sh- states shouldn't be allowed to do the kind of things that we did in iraq and libya and are doing in syria and that his it's kind of a means to an end kind of thing he thinks that the best way to do it now let me clarify i don't mean to say that went is arguing for some sort of you know psychopathic control grid i don't think that is what people like that are arguing i'm sure he is in good faith arguing for a system that he believes will be able to be the best checks that we can have against that he's not even arguing i think the key point that he's making and then we need to wrap this up because i've taken a lot of your time here but is the inevitability of it suggests that we should change our strategy and get out in front of it so that we can shape it in the best way we can i i agree I agree. And I think that that means uh, participating in agorism, voluntarism, voluntaristic uh, associations and things that will go around and and uh, beyond the, the authority of state control, like the peer to peer economy. And that's what I talk about all the time. We are creating. Yes, we are creating a global society, but it is one that doesn't have to be ruled over by some sort of governmental structure. James Corbett, Corbett Report. An interesting kind of counter to the very interesting article by Dr. Alexander Went. James, thanks so much for joining me and best of luck with all your work. Thanks for having me on. Always a pleasure. Thanks again to James Corbett for joining me in this dialogue with Dr. Alexander Went on the New World Order. I guess I'd have a couple of questions to tee up from this interview. One is, is there really a deep state political drive towards a one world state, towards a new world order, towards consolidation of power at that level? Is that even a remote possibility or is it just crazy conspiracy theory? And then question number two, since question one is a real lob question, question two is, is there any scenario under which we would want to get out in front of the issue, turn it around and say, okay, great, here's what a one world state should look like, here's how we want it to emerge? 
or should we resist that at every turn? Because as James Corbett says, the power structure that we have now is incapable of doing anything other than completely subverting and corrupting any efforts along those lines. So I know these questions are off target for the usual kind of things we talk about on Skeptico, but if you do feel inclined to jump in there and offer your opinion, the place to do so is through the Skeptico website at skeptico.com. You can jump on over to our forum and join the discussion there or drop me an email, connect with me on Facebook, whatever you like. While you're there, of course, you can download over 300 previous episodes of Skeptico. We did just cross the 300 mark of the show. All that is available there for free. You can also subscribe through iTunes, Stitcher. We have a YouTube channel that I put some of these out on. So if you're new to the show and you want to check that out, that's also a way to do it. I do hope to connect with you. I hope to continue this dialogue about consciousness, spirituality, and other big picture science questions that matter with the occasional drifting off into other issues that impact our society and our culture like today's show. So I have a number of great shows coming up. Stick with me for all of that. Until next time, take care and bye for now.